Peace be upon you and welcome to Rational Religion, where we make sense of spirituality. So today we are interviewing three of the top intelligent design advocates in the world. They're from the Discovery Institute. We had the pleasure of meeting them and speaking with them for about 20 minutes, half an hour. Yeah. So who are they? Um, so we had Stephen Mayer, who's very well known in the world, pretty much. Wonderful. Author of Darwin's Doubt, a fantastic book. We've also got Paul Nelson, who is a fantastic philosopher of science and a lovely chap. Now, of course, we have Doug Axe as well, who's recently released a new book called Undeniable, which I suggest you all go and check out. So um, have a look at the interview and let us know what you think in the comments below. We're hoping to do future uh, videos exploring Darwinian evolution versus intelligent design. So if you don't follow everything, subscribe below and we'll, we'll catch you up. Enjoy! I'm... Steve Meyer of the Discovery Institute. Paul Nelson, also of the Discovery Institute. Doug Axe, Director of Biologic Institute. And I'm Omar Nasser from Rational Religion. Um, we've got uh, three of the main proponents of intelligent design in the room, room with us. We're very uh, grateful that they can make the time for us. We wanted to give you guys a flavor of what intelligent design is and how it may be compatible with your worldview. Um, or if it's not, for you to explore intelligent design in a way that you may not have uh, done before. Um, I want to sort of start with the uh, more basic questions around the issue. So, um, Steve, if you could just give me a, a brief sketch of what intelligent design actually is, what the theory states. Sure. We'll start with the basic definition that we often use. Intelligent design is the idea or theory that there are certain features of the universe and of living systems that are best explained by a designing intelligence rather than an undirected process such as uh, uh, mutation and natural selection. How does intelligent design differ from, say, uh, creationism? Intelligent design as a mode of reasoning, as a way of thinking about the world, really belongs to the whole of humanity. In fact, you can find it in, I think, all of the world's great philosophies and religions. Ancient Greek philosophy was characterized by debates between defenders of a view that mind or intellect was primary in the universe versus the view that matter or the physical world was primary. And that's not tied to any particular religious viewpoint. Creationism properly understood is the attempt to reconcile science, empirical science, with some sacred text. So in my background, that would be the first 11 chapters of Genesis. How do those sacred writings fit in, if they do, with the findings of science. So creationism has much more of a theological aspect to it. And uh, for that reason, it is much more particular. It's not universal the way that intelligent design is. Thanks very much. Um, and how has the history of intelligent design progressed over the last 50, 60 years? Has the case been strengthened by any new data? Uh, yes, I would say that it has, um, quite dramatically so. Particularly in the last, say, 30 years, where we started to get um, information on gene sequences and protein sequences. So uh, in, in that time period, beginning in the 1980s, say, or 19, late 1970s, it became possible to look at the um, complexity of molecules that function inside cells, genes that encode proteins, and to start to ask um, whether these uh, informational molecules um, are tolerant of changes to their sequence, and if they are, how tolerant, and if they aren't very tolerant, how much information is, con is contained in one of these things. Uh, it's, it, it's taken many years and many people looking at these things to try to put numbers on that, but those numbers have come out. In, in recent years, I've put a number on the, uh, the fraction of possible protein sequences that can fold and function the way they have to inside cells, and it, it turns out to be an extraordinarily small fraction, one in 100 trillion, 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 which is not an easy target to hit. Those numbers were not, could not have been, although I think if you go all the way back, when people look at living things, they would say those that looks like it's been engineered, that looks like it's been made. Um, it's only relatively recently that we could put numbers on probabilities. So that, that has changed the argument, I think. 
might be good just to piggyback on doug's answer first because the the trend line in modern science first in cosmology in the early twentieth century then in physics in the nineteen sixty s and seventy s and then in biology from the fifty s sixty seventy s eighty s right up to the present i think has been one in which more and more evidence is coming to life that to light that points to a mind first rather than a matter first view of reality uh, in cosmology, you had the discovery that the universe has a definite beginning. In physics, the discovery that from the beginning, the physical laws and constants of physics have been finely tuned to allow for the possibility of life. And then in biology, in the area that uh, Doug has done so much research, you have the discovery of a molecule that contains digital code, which is necessary for the production of all these uh, proteins and protein machines. So we have nano machinery, we have information, information processing technology inside cells, all on a miniaturized scale. It's an exquisite level of uh, engineering design on display. And I think it really has put the issue of um, intelligent design as opposed to just the Darwinian idea of apparent or the uh, design or the illusion of design back on the table. So the science, I think, has been trending away from the strict materialist view of the 19th century to um, uh, a view that, that I think really needs to be open to the idea of agency or intelligence um, as being behind what we're seeing in the physical world. Just to say that um, when you look at living things in particular superficially, you may not perceive just how sophisticated they are. And I think the natural world is one in which the deeper you look at cells, the more you find, as Steve indicated, levels of sophisticated coding and engineering that someone can spend their entire life solving. Um, so uh, when I first met Doug, it was here in Cambridge in 1992, and he was uh, working on research involving these long information-bearing chains and how they're uh, expressed as protein. But the first time we met, he gave us a primer, Steve and I were there, uh, a primer on the motor that drives bacterial, the bacterial flagellum. And we, he, he gave this wonderful talk, it was very informal, but we came to the end and Doug basically said, this could never have happened by an undirected process. It's simply irrational to think that it could, in light of what I've said, where do we go from here? So I think intelligent design comes to a place where we say it's irrational to ascribe this level of sophisticated biological engineering basically to chance. Where do we go from here? So what encourages me is we are heading in the direction of new discoveries, new findings based on the premise that there was a mind behind the universe. I remember when we um, started exploring your literature and we came across, for instance, your work on um, trying to produce novel protein folds um, by chance and chain, uh, going from one protein which is um, functionally different to another protein, but they have similar structures. Even the mutations required to get from, one to the, from A to B is essentially prohibitive if you have a, a chance-based mechanism. And we sort of wondered, you know, well, where do they go from this? Where, how, what do the Darwinists say to that? Um, do they do they just say you've you've forged your evidence? Do they say um, there's some kind of other mechanism which we haven't thought of? I mean, what I'm asking is, is it the exception or is it the norm? And if it's the norm, how do they deal with it? Um, we um... They ignore it. <laughs> well, to some extent, that's the case. So the 2004 JMB paper that I had published put a number on the rarity of functional protein sequences, and that number was that scary number. Um, there hasn't been, uh, so far as I'm aware, there hasn't been in the literature a response that said, no, that's not correct. And it would be hard to do because there was other literature that was pointing that to that scary sort of number uh, anyway. So I really confirmed something more rigorously that was already there. There are people, though, um, on blogs who will say, it's not that hard. You can get a functional protein. They're 1 in 30 or something like that. Uh, you won't get serious people who work in the field that, that say that because it's, it's a silly thing to say. And I can't respond to all the, the blog people. On the A to B transition, you shouldn't even we, try. yeah, sometimes you just let it go. On the A to B transitions, interestingly, we have combed the literature. 
I should say, before Anne and I started working on the A to B, we were very open to the possibility that it would actually work. And in fact, we thought if we can get this to work, it'd be a really cool paper because we show how long it would take in, in the wild, but we did it in the, in the lab. We found that it wouldn't work. We couldn't get it to work. And we found that the change is so complicated that it would never happen in the wild. Nor could we find any convincing case in the literature of an A to B that would work other than an A that already does B to a small extent. And that we didn't want to look at that case. So those, those cases do work. So we have uh, an absence of any literature that confirms something that's thought to be a universal explanation for how you get protein diversity, which is a severe problem. We anticipated a complaint, and we uh, thought we staved it off in the paper that describes this. The complaint that we anticipated was, someone will say, when we show this A cannot evolve this, the function of this B in even billions of years, someone will say, no one said that that was the source of the B that you're looking at. The B came from some other prior source. And so in our discussion, we said, or even in the introduction, we said, we're not looking at historical transitions here. We're asking the more general question, can enzymes acquire new functions under selective pressure to acquire new functions? And if they can't, or if, if in an ideal case, a very favorable case, we can show that it can't happen, then we've undercut the whole, uh, that whole explanatory framework, and that's what we think we have. What have they said in response? They have said um, that A, you picked a wrong, the wrong system, that A did not evolve into, the, into that B, and furthermore, by looking at modern enzymes, you're looking at things that are locked in. They're so perfected by natural selection that they can't evolve anymore. So, and we, we thought that's a remarkable uh, change of tactic because it's effectively saying evolution does not work. They're conceding that in the present tense, evolution does not work, but claiming that it did work on some special things that nobody can find. And if we tried to find them and they didn't work, they'd say you didn't find the right thing. So it becomes, it really isolates the theory from any sort of testing at all, which, which we think shows that it, it's become a desperate theory. Uh, it's frustrating to have all the interesting evolution be put out of sight in the past because that renders, as Doug has said, renders the theory uh, invulnerable to ordinary testing. Uh, and I think many evolutionary biologists are troubled by that. And we had just attended a meeting from the Royal Society where one of the issues that came up is we, we being the evolutionary biology community, needs to demonstrate how these transitions occurred, and an unwillingness to rely on magical processes in the past that you can't directly observe. One of the things I like about Doug's experiment is that it, uh, <clears throat> I think it's lights out for the, for the, <laughs> yeah. for the neodarnos because uh, they scoured the database, the protein databases, looking for uh, proteins that were very closely aligned. They have the same fold structure, and they looked for things that were very similar and found the best case, and they couldn't make this transition work in with for the best case scenario. The fundamental unit of biological innovation is a, a protein fold, and that's way beyond what what can be uh, plausibly demonstrated in a reasonable time frame. So if you can't get the molecular Darwinism mechanism to generate even a new protein fold. How are you going to you're going to generate the more fundamental uh, innovations in form and structure? Um, can't do the small thing. You're not going to do the big things. So it's I it's I, I think it's been a very uh, powerful line of research that that Doug has done with Ann Gager, and I think it's it's sort of thrown down the gauntlet. And uh, as far as we can see, no one's really picked it up yet. One thing that confuses me is that um, why hasn't the whole evolutionary biology um, field accepted your results? Because I thought scientists were supposed to be perfectly rational beings. They're perfectly human beings. Right. And it's human to be committed to a worldview or a philosophy uh, despite contrary evidence. And I think the commitment on the part of many evolutionary biologists is not really to the theory. It's rather to an underlying philosophy that says, 
When we explain the world, we can only use natural laws and chance processes, sometimes known as materialism or naturalism. Now that is a much more fundamental commitment because you end up interpreting the evidence in the light of that, of that lens or through that lens. Uh, and I think, having been at this for 30 years, that's much more challenging because scientific evidence we can weigh, right? A philosophy, especially if you're fundamentally committed to it, that's much more challenging. So I think we need to be honest about where the conflict really lies. And I think scientifically, yes, of course, there are disputes. But someone committed to a worldview in which intelligence or mind first has been categorically excluded, it's hard to reason with that person. I would just add that it, it's, I think it's a little, that's one element of it. I think it's a little more complicated in that um, I suspect it's a fraction of the life science community and the scientific community that's actually committed to materialism. It might be a small-ish fraction, but a very vocal, very powerful fraction that has somehow got control of the academy. And maybe a larger fraction is not philosophically under that umbrella, but they're afraid of the implications of, of falling out of line with it. So it's really one of these sort of political things where um, one view has become the powerful view, and if you care about your career, you will, you will not <laughs> rock the boat, fall, fall out of line with respect to that view. I think that's the situation. Just to start bringing it to a close, um, sort of a, a final question before I, I, I talk about sort of some of the work that you've done more recently with your books. Um, do you think it's realistic for the scientific community to accept intelligent design when um, society as a whole increasingly doesn't believe in a designer? Um, I'm not sure I agree with the premise of the question because uh, polling data indicate for, for many younger people especially, that they don't believe that they are uh, strictly physical systems. In other words, they say, I'm spiritual, I'm, I might not be religious, right? But in my experience, interacting with all kinds of audiences, people recognize the reality of their own causality, their, of their own agency, and they are unwilling to surrender that and turn themselves into strictly physical systems. Uh, and I think that provides an, uh, a way to engage in dialogue and say, look, you know that you can bring about effects that are real, that exist in the world, that are explained only really by reference to your unique personality. Um, so I think I'm somewhat more optimistic that the reality of consciousness, the reality of agency, and coupled, when that's coupled with the shortcomings of the naturalistic view of, of science, creates great promise for intelligent design. I'm reminded of a study that, that, that argued, it was published, it argued that um, stunning nature documentaries um, are bad for science. And what, <laughs> what, they re, what they really found was that when people watch these documentaries, even if they describe themselves as atheists, they are more inclined after looking at them to ascribe some sort of direction or per, purpose or intentionality. To, to life. So uh, I found it very humorous, the interpretation was that's bad for science, whereas actually it's, it's bad for materialism. So I think actually there is a broad openness to some something that looks a lot like design, even among people who don't describe themselves as theists, even among people who describe themselves as atheists or, or agnostics, which is interesting. Doug, I understand you've written a, uh, a new book. Could you tell us a bit about that book? having become very convinced myself that the Darwinian explanation does not work and published papers along the way in peer-reviewed scientific journals, I wanted, uh, with the opportunity to write a book, not to speak to scientists, but to speak to everyone, including scientists. And so um, I thought the best way to do that was not to simplify a scientific technical argument, but rather to recognize that at root, um, in, in its most basic elements, this is not a technical argument. At, in, its, in its most basic form, there is a strong intuition and there is basic reasoning that I call common science. It's common sense and um, ordinary observation, everyday observation, that confirms this intuition that life is, is designed. So I wrote the book around, starting with the intuition, 
um, observing that everyone has it, and this is broadly acknowledged, and then using simple everyday sort of evidence to show that it's actually correct. And then also weaving in um, the scientific studies that, that confirm it. So in other words, <laughs> at the end of the day, I end up saying the four-year-olds were right, and I spent 25 <laughs> years in a lab showing that the four-year-olds were right. That's the kind of book. Um, Stephen, uh, I understand you, you've had a book, uh, Darwin's Doubt, and before that signature in the cell. Um, what are the sort of, what, what different areas do they focus on? Both books are concerned with the fundamental problem of the origin of information. And, the, and what the discovery of information tells us properly about the origin of life or the origin of new forms of animal life. The first book was about the origin of the first life. The second book was about the origin of the, animal, the first animals in an event in the history of life known as the Cambrian Explosion. And uh, I examined the problems that information causes uh, for evolutionary theories and then in both cases argue that it's better explained, the origin of information necessary to build life or necessary to build new animals is better explained by a designing intelligence because of what we know from our uniform and repeated experience, namely that information, especially in a digital or alphabetic form, always arises from an intelligent source. So I'm appealing to our uniform and repeated experience of cause and effect, which is a properly scientific thing to do, but it's also, as Doug says, part of our ordinary reasoning. And so our, our uh, conclusion of design is supported by our best science and our common sense reasoning. Paul, um, just to, to finally wrap up, do you have any uh, message to people who are maybe in the research world in the life sciences who see evidence for design but feel a bit trapped in their current situation? Yes, get in touch with us. <laughs> <laughs> we know how difficult it is and we'll protect your your, your privacy, but there is a wonderful network forming of like-minded thinkers from philosophy to theology to science, even to politics and cultural studies. Uh, and we all have a stake in this, right? And one of the great things about the internet is you can have an invisible college. You don't have to be in the same room. You don't have to be in the same building. You can be, as, we, as is the case, all over the world interacting on a daily basis. So there are plenty of ways of joining the community, being productive, and uh, it's a tremendous amount of fun. That's the secret that we share, right? That actually this is really fun and uh, I look forward to going to work every day. Well, that's all we have today. Let us know what you think in the comments below and if you want more dialogue and debate around the existence of God, make sure to subscribe below. Subscribe, subscribe below. <laughs>